right, let's stand together. Hymn number 400 in the red book, 400 in the red book. Take my life and let it be, 400. you're here tonight. Thank you so much for being in church on this Wednesday evening. Let's pray together. Father, we love you tonight and we are thankful for your people that have made their way out to church on this uh, Wednesday evening. Lord, I know there's some that are not here due to illness. God, I pray you touch them and help them. And Lord, I pray that you would bring them back to us as soon as possible. And Lord, I just pray, God, for this service tonight. Lord, as we hear your word, as we sing, Lord, as we spend time tonight in prayer, God, I just pray that you'd help us, empower us, and use us, and to glorify your son through us tonight, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Let's get around and shake hands tonight. seats. Let's take that red hymnal one more time. 477 in that red book. 477, He Keeps Me Singing.
Let's sing all of them. Verse 4. Though sometimes he leads to waters deep, trials fall across the after we sing this last verse number five. Sing he's coming back to welcome me far beyond the storm. Get your Bibles tonight. We're in the book of Acts. The book of Acts, please. All right, the book of Acts, chapter number 21. Uh, tonight I'm going to give you something that uh, from a devotion uh, the Lord gave me while just reading through the Bible, some thoughts, and I want to show them to you tonight. Next week, Lord willing, uh, we're going to be dealing with, now I've kind of gone down a rabbit hole with some of this, uh, but uh, next week somebody, uh, somebody asked a question concerning the law. And uh, next week, I'm going to be dealing uh, with the subject of the law. And uh, we're going to look at the different aspects of the law. And uh, we're going to see about the moral law, how it reflects the character of God. And uh, we're going to talk about morality in society. How do we know what true morality is? And anyway, it's going to, I, it, it may take us more than one uh, Wednesday night because it is a very, very, uh, uh, I think it's an important subject. Uh, but it is a very expansive subject. I've tried to uh, condense it down, but the only problem with condensing things down is I was looking at my notes, I'm skipping thoughts. And when you skip thoughts, when you're trying to take people down a train of thought, you skip a thought. If you're on a train, you skip a track, you're going off the tracks, right? And so we want to make sure that we all understand. I think it'll be a helpful lesson uh, because it is so important and uh, we'll be looking at that, Lord willing, uh, next Wednesday night and maybe the Wednesday night after that. So uh, we're in Acts chapter 20 tonight, so we're going to be off track tonight. We're not going to uh, be on our uh, series tonight. I just want to give you a the devotional thought that the Lord gave me today. And, and me saying a devotional thought, don't be thinking it's going to be a very short message uh, because uh, it has uh, four main points. And under the fourth point, it has several sub, sub, sub points. So anyway, uh, I'm going to show you something from the Scripture today, something that was an encouragement to me, a good reminder as I was reading through the Bible this morning. And uh, we'll see what the Lord has for us tonight. Acts chapter number 20. Let's stand together, please. And uh, add a love and respect for the Word of God. We're going to start reading in verse number 17. And uh, we're going to read down through verse number 27. Uh, you'll, be, you'll easily recognize this passage as we go through it. Uh, it's a very well-known passage of Scripture. The Bible says, And from Miletus he, this is Paul, sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know... 
from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Save the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life, uh, dear unto myself, so that I, may, that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I, have shun, not, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. We're going to stop Paul's sermon right there. Our main thought is going to come from verse number 24 right there at the beginning uh, of the verse. I want you to look at it with me. The Bible simply says this. Paul says, but none of these things move me. So now I want to give you just a devotional thought on this. What will it take to move us? What will it take to move us? Paul said nothing is going to move him. question tonight for us is what will it take to move us? Let's pray. Father, we love you tonight, and we're thankful that we're able to be here on this Wednesday evening. Lord, I am thankful for our church family. Lord, it's an honor that I get to be their pastor and to fellowship with them, and Lord, just to be able to spend time with them around the Word of God. And Lord, I pray that the labor that I've put into the message, Lord, would not just be evident physically, but Lord, I pray it would be evident spiritually in the hearts and lives of people uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, Lord, I pray that for the next few moments as we talk about this subject, about being moved, I pray, God, that you would help us as your people to desire to be steadfast and unmovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord. Now, Father, I pray you'd help us tonight. I pray you'd bless our time together, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This chapter contains Paul's final sermon that he delivered to the elders of the pastors uh, there in the city of Ephesus. After this sermon, Paul is going to get on a ship and he is not going to see them anymore. And eventually he'll be taken to Rome and some other things will befall the Apostle Paul. But this is his uh, finale, if you will. This is his sermon uh, to the church reminding them of his life before them. Now, as you look at this sermon, I want you to notice, first of all, uh, the, how Paul reminds the people of several things. Go back to verse uh, number, uh, go back to verse number, let's look at verse number 19. Notice Paul reminds them of his tears. Verse number 19 says, Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears. Paul was a humble man, and his humility was seen through the tears uh, that he shed. So Paul was a, a man who wept. Now, when I read through that verse, it made me think about some prophets in the Old Testament, such as Jeremiah, who's called the weeping prophet, because he wept over people and he wept over their sins because... Uh, he loved them. And so Paul, here's a man that uh, loves these people there in Ephesus. And here he's weeping over them. He, he was with them serving and he had many tears. Not only does he remind them of his tears, but verse number 19, notice he mentions his temptations. The Bible says, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews. So he mentions his faithful service to the Lord uh, through these temptations. He had many trials uh, that he had to go through, many difficulties, many uh, times. I believe the Apostle Paul was faced with either quit or die, but Paul per uh, persevered on, and uh, through his many temptations, he continued to serve Christ. Look at verse number 19. You'll notice here that Paul begins to remind them not only of his tears and temptations, but also of his troubles. There in verse 19, it says, Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me 
by the lying and weight of the Jews. He faced many troubles uh, from his own countrymen. But notice his response in verse 20. He says, Now how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly, and that from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith, toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying, notice that bonds and afflictions abide me. Paul was letting them know that not only did he have tears and temptations in the past, but he was going to be dealing with troubles in the future. Now what kind of troubles? Well, look at verse number 23. It says bonds. That means being put in jail. That means to be shackled. So troubles. And then he talks about afflictions. That means uh, painful abiding, painful uh, living. It means to, uh, to be in a time of difficulty or trouble. And so Paul says, yes, in the past I've had tears and I've had temptations. And I'm looking forward according to what the Holy Ghost is witnessing in every city. He said I know that I know that bonds and afflictions are going to abide me. Notice the word abide. These bonds and afflictions not going to be a fleeting thing, but they're going to abide with him. His troubles are not just going to come and go, but his, uh, his troubles are going to continue with him. Paul's going to have another imprisonment after the one he's talking about now. And so Paul is going to know what it is to suffer in prison uh, for his faith. And so Paul reminds them of his tears and temptations of the past. But he also reminds them of the troubles now that he is going to be facing in the future. And after these reminders, Paul is going to reveal to them his resolve. Notice what the Bible says in verse number 24. Paul says, I have dealt with tears and temptations, and I'm also going to deal with troubles in the future, and they're going to abide me. But notice in verse number 24 what Paul says, but none of these things... That's the tears, that's the temptations, that's the troubles. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify uh, the gospel of the grace of God. Paul says, yes, I've been through a lot of stuff. But I am resolved in spite of the tears, the temptations, and troubles. I am resolved uh, to not let any of those things move me. I am resolved uh, to be faithful. I am resolved, the Bible says here, to finish my course with joy. You know, I believe that should be the desire of every Christian. I don't know about you, but I'm running a race. I'm trying to not run against you, not trying to run against people in the community. I am running a race before my Lord. I'm running it to win a prize. I'm running it to plea, and that prize is His pleasure. I'm running that race, and here's what I want to do. I want to finish my course with joy. But you know what it's going to take to finish our course? It's going to take resolve. It's going to take a spirit where we have a desire uh, where nothing is going to be able to move us. Not our weeping at night. Not our temptations during the day. And not the troubles that will abide us in the future. But there must be a resolve that we're going to continue to serve God come what may. Now if you look through the Bible you'll find Paul was a man of great resolve. Paul and 2 Timothy, we find that he gives us the testimony where he finishes his course. He says, I'm going to finish my course. And then over in 2 Timothy, what did he say? He said, I fought a good fight. I have finished what? The race. And he goes on to say, henceforth there's a crown awaiting him over there in 2 Timothy. So what he's saying is this. I have resolved that I'm going to finish my course. And what did Paul do through that resolve and by the grace of God? He finished his course. He was not moved. He was not moved by being stoned. He was not moved by all the different things that he faced in life or would face in life. He, by the grace of God, and by the way, he understood it's going to be by the grace of God that he would continue, but it's he, by the grace of God, had a spirit where none of these things are going to move me. The Bible talks about our, if, we, if we faint in the day of adversity, the Bible says our strength is what? Small. Listen, we are faced with fainting. 
If you've lived any time in life, you understand tears, temptations, and troubles, and you understand the, 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 the overwhelming pressure sometimes where you feel like quitting. But you've got to resolve to press on. You've got to resolve to uh, not allow any of those things to move you. God's got a purpose for your life, and God's got a plan for your life. God's will for your life is perfect and God's will for your life, if you will allow Him to do it, He will perform it through your life. What is our responsibility? Our responsibility is just to be submissive to God in all the phases of life and not get sidetracked by all the things uh, by which we can get sidetracked in life. Paul would not be moved. He would not be deterred by anything that would hinder him from following God's will in his life, I read something that kind of made me laugh today. Uh, somebody wrote this. Uh, it takes 90 gallons of water to baptize a Christian, but only takes about nine drops of rain to keep them at home instead of church. And I thought about that. Isn't that true? Oh, I'm resolved. Nothing's going to move me, but it's raining outside, so I'll stay home. Listen, that's not the spirit we're talking about. That's not the spirit of Christianity. The spirit of Christianity is this. I'm going to resolve to do everything in my power to please my Lord. And so, friend, I want you to know we've got to have a resolved attitude and we've got to decide that nothing is going to move us by the help of God. First Peter, or First Corinthians chapter 15, that is the great resurrection chapter. And you know, Paul gives an admonishment there in that resurrection chapter in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. He says this, Therefore, my beloved brethren, therefore is written there to connect it to the previous verses that's dealing with the rapture and the resurrection. Because one day we're going to leave this world and we're going to stand before Jesus Christ. Because one day our fleshly body is going to go in the ground, but our soul is going to go be with Jesus. And one day we'll be re, uh, reunited body and soul again there with the Lord in the air. Because of these things, Paul says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, I like this, be ye steadfast. You know what the next word is? Unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We need to be unmovable. That is God's will. If you were to say, Pastor, what is God's will for my life right now? It's to be unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You know, it's a blessing to be in a church where when people get out of church, they can come back to the same church when they get their hearts right with the Lord and find some of those same old saints of God still serving God and still being faithful. That's an important thing. But we live in a transient society, a mobile society, if you will, a movable society, and it's affected all areas of our life. If any opposition comes, we're movable. But according to the Scriptures, we're to be unmovable in the will of God concerning our lives. Now, let me ask you a pointed yet powerful and pertinent question uh, for you to ponder this evening. What will it take to move us away from the will of God? What will it take for you to be moved away from the will of God? What is that one thing that you could face that would cause you uh, to be moved away from the will of God? Paul says, none of these things move me, but it made me wonder what will move us. Let me give you some points tonight. Number one, will problems move us? Will problems move us? Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Will problems uh, move us? Will these problems that we face in life move us away from the will of God? Will these problems move us out of the will of God? You know, sometimes people can be in church. They can love God. They can serve Him. But whenever problems come, they crumple under the problems of life. And the first thing they quit is church and God. I don't understand that. I don't understand why God's the first thing to go whenever you're going through uh, problems. Now, you and I know people like that. They were serving God, but a problem came their way. They were tripped up by that problem, and now they're not serving God. They don't think about God. They don't want anything to do with the Lord. Problems move them. Let me ask you tonight, will problems move us away? Will problems take us away from the will of God? Well, look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and... 
Verse number 1, Paul writes this, Wherefore, when I could no longer forbear, I thought it good to be left at Athens alone and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, our fellow laborer in the gospel, to establish you and comfort you concerning your faith. Now, why was he sending Timothy? So that they would be comfort concerning their faith. That means that they're having trouble right now and it's because of their faith. So Timothy's going to comfort them in their troubles concerning their faith. Now look at verse number 3. That no man should be moved by these afflictions. Paul sending Timothy to comfort the people of God as they go through their problems so that they'll be not moved by those problems. He says, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. You know what Paul will say? He said, I've got news for you. You're facing afflictions and those afflictions are appointed for us. You know, we talk about the good things that are appointed for us, right? But do you realize that God, sometimes, according to the scriptures, our afflictions are appointed for us. By God as well. And I can't understand all those things. I can't explain to you uh, the why behind the afflictions of life. But one thing I can understand is this. If I am dealing with affliction in life, something is happening to me because of my faith in Christ. I am struggling. Whatever it might be, the difficulty that I'm facing, I have to understand that I need not be moved by these afflictions because these afflictions, according to verse number 3, are appointed thereunto, they're appointed to us. For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass. And you know for this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. Paul's saying this, I'm sending Timothy to comfort you because I'm worried about you that you're going to, you're going to be moved by the problems that you're facing. Now, I know this tonight. We all have problems. Doesn't matter who you are tonight. We could sit down together tonight and we probably could fill up a notebook with all the problems that we all have, right? Whether it be health problems, whether it be family problems, whether it be work problems, whatever problem, car problems, whatever it is, we can tell you about all of our problems, right? But as a Christian, I've got to understand that I cannot let problems affect me to the point where I move away from the will of God. Listen, I need God. I need God especially when the world is falling apart and I'm dealing with problems. I need God. And so, friend, when problems come your way, don't be moved by the problems. Look at it as a divine appointment from the hand of God. Is that not what the Scripture says in verse 3? Oh, we love to talk about <coughs> the good appointments. You know where he appoints our bills to get paid, our cars to get fixed, our health to get better. But you know, sometimes that's not always God's will. Sometimes he appoints unto us affliction. You say, I don't believe that. Have you read the book of Job? I'll not rehearse it. Everybody in here knows the story of Job. Hey, sometimes God appoints affliction. And as a Christian, I've got to resolve that the problems that I face in life are not going to drive me away from the will of God. Let me ask you tonight. Will problems move you away from the will of God? Maybe you've prayed about something for years and God hasn't jumped through your hoop to do what you've told Him He ought to do in your life. And that problem is so taking root in your heart that you're bitter and you're angry. And that problem is driving a wedge between you and God because God's not doing according to your view, his end of the bargain. You remember Paul had a thorn in the flesh. I don't know of any greater Christian than the Apostle Paul. Paul asked for something three times and what did God do? God denied that prayer. God said that thorn is for you, Paul. You've been appointed that thorn. Whatever you think that thorn is, we'll not get into that tonight. There are a lot of ideas what the thorn might be. But the fact of the matter is this. God appointed that thorn and you know what a thorn is? A thorn is irritating and a thorn is painful. And you know what else? A thorn is something you want removed. If you've ever got a, a thorn, you ever got a splinter in your hand, what's the first thing you try to do? If you're a kid, you just run around and scream. But if you've got common sense, you want to get that, 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 that uh, wood that's in your hand out. Why? Because it's painful, it's irritating, and it's got to go, Right? And so Paul was in a place where he was dealing with that problem, that thorn. But God said this. God said, no, Paul. That's what he said. Paul, three times. Paul, who could heal 
God gave him the power to heal certain individuals. Paul, who had, had that, uh, the signs of the apostle, could not remove his own thorn. Why? Because that thorn is appointed for him. What did God say to him? No, Paul. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee. And then nobody likes to hear about the grace of God when they're going through troubles, not getting a certain prayer answered, dealing with some difficulty. But listen, friend, that's what's so wonderful about grace. Whatever the problem, there's grace for that problem. And grace is like a salve. And grace helps us as we deal with that. But let me ask you tonight, is there going to be a problem that you're facing that's driving a wedge between you and God? Is that problem going to move you away from God? Or is it going to move you closer to God? Number one, will problems move us? Number, excuse me, number two, what about prosperity? Will prosperity move us? Go to 1 uh, Timothy chapter number 6. Some people go through problems and they'll get as close to Christ as they can when they go through problems, but when they get back on the mountaintop and everything is wonderful, they wind up moving away from the Lord. You know what the book of Judges is about? People that are stuck in a sin cycle. Whenever I, I taught through Judges, <coughs> uh, and, and whenever I taught through Judges, I called that book Stuck in the Sin Cycle because that's what it was. They would, they would be right with God. They, they'd back, God would bless them. They would backslide during the blessings. God would send a beating. Then they would repent, and then God would bless them again, and it would go around and around and around. That's what the whole book of Judges... 400 years worth is what we find in the book of Judges. People stuck in the sin cycle. Why? Because they couldn't handle prosperity when God would bless them. Some people are okay when problems come because it drives them to Christ because they have no place else to go. But there's another group of people that when prosperity comes, those that would run to Christ under problems, whenever prosperity comes, they will actually get away from Christ. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. If you're there, let's look at verse number 6. The Bible says, But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we shall carry nothing out. What did you come into this world? Nothing but your sin. What did you come into this world with? Absolutely nothing. And it's certain you're going to carry nothing out. Look at verse number 8. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Can I ask you a question tonight? You got on clothes? I do too. I really do too. Everybody here has clothes on their back right now, right? You may not have the $2,000 suit, but everybody's got clothes on their back, right? What about food? Have you eaten yet? I haven't eaten yet, but I know there's food waiting at the house for me. The Bible says this, and having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Wait a minute. We're not content with just food and raiment, are we? Verse 9. But they that... It doesn't say are rich. Sometimes when people preach on this, they make that will be. They change it into an are. They may read the right verse, but they'll change it into an are. But they that are rich fall into temptation. No. They that will be rich. You know what will be means? That means an overwhelming desire to be. It's their will. It's what they're living their life for. They that will be. They're doing everything they can to uh, gain all the wealth they can while they can. The Bible says this, but they that will be rich, to have that desire, fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition for the love of money is the root of of all evil. It doesn't say money is the root of all evil. This is that will concerning money, that overpowering drive where money is all that matters. That love of money, that desire to have money, the Bible says is the root of all evil. Now look what the rest of that verse says. A lot of people stop right there. Paul says this, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after. You know what that is? That's that will to be rich, that's that love of money, that coveting, which while some coveted after, they have what from the faith? Erred from the faith. You know, what that, you know what that means? That means they've strayed away. They've been moved away. What were they moved away by? This overcoming desire to have more and 
more and more. And they're not content with anything that they have. And you know what it causes? They have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You know who are some of the most unhappy people in all the world? Rich people who that's all they live their life for. That's all they live their life for. To get more money. And they're worried about who's going to take their money. Right? You know, a lot of Christians, whenever we have problems, we're close to Christ as we can get because we have no ability to take care of the problem, right? But what about when Christ blesses you with some prosperity? What about when he answers your prayer? What about whenever he gives you that desire of your heart? What if he gives you that job that you've been praying for? You know, I've seen some folks that God has blessed, that God blessed them with a good job. They prayed, Lord, I need this job. And God blessed them with a good job. Yet after getting that good job and God taking care of their physical needs while they're enjoying that, they start missing church. And you say, preacher, is missing church that big of a deal? Missing church is not the problem. It's only a symptom of the problem. If you miss church and you don't care that you miss church, that's a heart problem. And that shows a relationship between you and God's not what it ought to be. And so there are people that God will bless them and, and prosper them. And in that prosperity, instead of running toward Christ, they wind up being moved. They err from the faith. Let me ask you tonight, will prosperity move you? If God were to give you the desires of your heart, would that move you away from the will of God? You know, God's will is not always that bass boat on the lake. Because if God gave you a bass boat for the lake, you'd want to be on it on Sunday. I'm simply saying, will prosperity move you? Hey, you don't have to pray about that light bill coming in anymore. Right? You don't have to seek God anymore about those, uh, those simple necessities, food. Be careful, don't let prosperity move you from the will of God. I know some people that will move away from a good church to take a job, and there's no good churches anywhere around that job. They got a couple choices, drive a long way to church. And I know some of our guys from Brother J and M on Pipeline, sometimes they would drive a long way just to get to a church. I understand that, and that's a good thing. Most people don't have that kind of character. So they can either drive a long way to church, two hours, two and a half hours to church, or they can start a church, which for most people that's, neat, that's not going to be an option either way. But they'll move their families away from a good church, take a job somewhere, and it'll absolutely destroy their children. Prosperity might move you. Number three, what about this? Will pleasures move us? 2 Timothy chapter 4, you're right there, 2 Timothy chapter 4. What will move you away from the will of God? Will problems move us? Will pleasures move us? 2 Timothy 4 verse number 10, notice this statement here. Paul is at the end of his life and you think friends would want to rally around the apostle Paul. But when you read 2 Timothy chapter number 4, you find a sad commentary in this text that there's Paul... And he's all alone. Would you look at 2 Timothy 4.10? The Bible says this, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Christians to Galatia, and Titus unto Dalmatia. You know what pleasures entered into this man Demas' life? This world and all the pleasures that it could give him caused him to depart when he should have stayed. What am I saying? Sometimes pleasures can move us from the will of God. I love college football, but I promise you this, I will not, I will not put college football above my church. We were in Texas, and you've got to understand out there we didn't have ESPN. We were too poor for ESPN. All right, We were lucky to get just the antenna channels, right? And, um, and Florida was actually playing Maryland on a Wednesday night. It was a big bowl game. Matter of fact, it became, and this won't mean anything to you guys, but it, it helps me tell the story because it, it jars my memory. Uh, that would be actually Steve, Spurrier, Steve Spurrier's, uh, the great coach of the Florida Gators, his last game as the coach. 
And you know what? We were having revival that week. And why in the world would they do a bowl, bowl game on a Wednesday night? Don't they know people have to go to church? But you know what? I had to choose. I'm either going to go to church or watch a football game. So I recorded the football game went to church. Listen, the most important thing is not the pleasures that this world affords. It's the will of God. I have found troubles through pleasures. But I have found nothing but the joy of God through obedience. What about pleasures? Is that going to move you? Well, what about this uh, pleasure that I have? Let me ask you, why does that pleasure move you away from the will of God? Is God not good enough? Number four, will problems move us? Will prosperity move us? Will pleasures move us? Number four, will people move us? You know, it's usually not a what, but it's usually a who that winds up infecting us away from the will of God. You say, is that in the Bible? Go to Galatians chapter 3. Go to Galatians chapter number 3. While you're turning there, let me remind you of another passage, John 21. There was a man by the name of Simon Peter who said unto the rest of the disciples, I go a fishing. Peter was not saying that I'm just going to go uh, fish on a Saturday afternoon. When Peter said, I go a fishing, he's saying this, I'm going to get those nets that I hung up, and I'm going back to my old occupation. This thing of serving Christ is done. I'm going back to the old way of life. Peter said, I go a fishing. And in John 21, 3, the Bible says, They say unto him, We also go with thee. And they went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night they caught nothing. Peter said, I go a fishing. And the other ones that were there said, Hey, we're going to go with you. You know what he did? He, he moved them away from the will of God. Now, you're there in Galatians. Look at chapter 3 and verse 1. He says, Oh, foolish Galatians, Paul does. Who hath bewitched you? Notice who, not what. Who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth and crucified among you? A, pe a people were moving them away from the gospel. People were causing them to move away from the will of God. Look in Galatians chapter 2. He gives an example of people being moved away. Galatians chapter 2. Verse number 11, the Bible says, But when Peter was come to Antioch, Paul is rehearsing an incident that happened at Antioch. And we'll talk about the church at Antioch in a few weeks on Sunday night. But he's rehearsing an incident that happened there. Peter came to Antioch because he heard everybody, all these people were getting saved. And Peter came there to inspect it. He came there to help the church uh, and, and, and those kind of things. But Peter, when Peter was come to Antioch, Notice verse 11, the Bible says, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, so somebody else came from Jerusalem after Peter arrived. For before that certain, that person that came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, it wasn't just one person, now he's saying they, it's a group of people, were come. He withdrew himself and separated, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews, the other people that were there that were Jewish, dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. So Peter was there. He was eating. He and Barnabas were eating with the Gentiles. Somebody came from Jerusalem with their group. And uh, they saw the Peter and them eating with the Gentiles. And those Jews said, I'm not eating with a Gentile. They separated themselves. Peter got drawn away from the truth. He got uh, drawn away from the right way because of people. Not only did Peter do it, you'll find Barnabas. Barnabas is the son of consolation, the great encourager in the Bible. He was pulled away from, from the truth of fellowshipping with everybody from the will of God. Because of people. And I will tell you this, sometimes pleasures don't move us, prosperity doesn't move us, and not even problems. But sometimes people do. You say, what kind of people? Well, critical people. People who are critical of your living for Jesus and they'll let you know about it. People that are critical of the church. People that are critical of everything, even you behind your back. Critical people. People that are criticizing, they'll move you. What about challenging people? That's people who are difficult to deal with. Don't they move you? You see them coming, you want to get out of their way? 
Well, sometimes challenging people will move us away from the will of God. What about carnal people? That's worldly people, whether Christian or otherwise, that want to drag you down to where they're at. Carnal people, will they move you? What about cruel people? People that are hateful and spiteful and just plain mean. What about controversial people? Somebody's always trying to stir up some controversy. They're going to move you away from the will of God. It's always a who. What about a charismatic? What about charismatic people? That's not, uh, that's not the people that speak in tongues, but those that have great charisma that you're drawn to. You know, there are false teachers everywhere that's good. That'll teach you something. And because they're so charismatic in the way that they present it, hey, some of God's people get drawn away by that garbage. What about charismatic people drawing you away? What about crumbling people? What is that? That's people who have fallen into or are living in sin. What about people, preachers that were once pastoring, they've fallen into sin. Is that going to cause you to get away from God? Hey, that preacher may fail you, but God himself will not. Well, crumbling people. What about crazy people? I had to put crazy people down because I am one of them. What about crazy people? You know, we'd be foolish to ignore that there have been, there are, and there will be crazies who call themselves independent Baptists. But let me say this. There are crazies that call themselves Southern Baptists. There are crazies that call themselves charismatic. There's crazies everywhere. But let me say this. If you're an independent Baptist, you should be one by conviction and you're not going to allow those fringes, those crazy people, to cause you to move away from the will of God. They're a bunch of crazy people. I try hard not to be crazy. You may think I am, but I try very hard not to be crazy. But the fact is this. There are crazy people all around us, and they'll say, well, I'm going to overcorrect. Because they're crazy, I'm going to overcorrect. And you know what you wind up doing? You wind up leaving the faith. Because of your overcorrection. What about childish people? Will they move you? Those that are immature in their faith and immature in their dealings with others. You know, there's a lot of immature people. They may have been saved for 40 years, but they're immature. How do you know they're immature? Because, they, number one, they don't know the Bible and they don't know how to deal with people. They're immature. And sometimes childish people hurt people with the words they say and the things that they do. What about covering people? You say, what's a covering person? That's something who's involved in a cover-up of sin and crime. You say, are there Christians that have done that? Yep. I know people that are in jail because of that. We ought not ever cover up sin and crime. Somebody commits a crime, they go to jail. They're dealt with by the authorities. But the fact is this, there are people that, are you going to let somebody else's actions cause you to get away from God? What about complaining people? Those folks that are always complaining about something. You know, there are some people, you give them $1,000, they'll complain because it wasn't $1,500. You want to give me $1,000, I'd take it, I'd say thank you, and I'd mean it. But there's some people that, you give them $1,000, they'll say, how come it wasn't $1,100, right? People that complain about everything. I don't like the carpet. I don't like the paint. I don't like, I don't like, I don't like. Is there anything you do like? Complaining people will infect you, and you know what you'll do? You'll get around them, they'll complain, then you'll start complaining, and then it'll turn into a big mess. You know a lot of churches blow up because of complaining people? What about this? Will changing people move us? Those that are unstable, always moving in what they believe, constantly changing, never the same. They disappoint us. Hey, is that going to move you? Here's the fact. I can give you a bunch of more C's, but I'm not going to do it tonight. But the fact is this. There's always a reason to quit. And if you're looking for a reason long enough, you're going to find a reason to move away from your faith. You're going to find a reason to get out of church. You're going to find a reason to quit praying. You're going to find a reason why you don't do whatever it is God wants you to do. You're going to find a reason. The fact is this, as believers, here's what we must do. We must find the reason not to quit. I don't have time. Go read chapter 20 again. And I want you to read through there how Paul magnifies Christ through that text. You know what Paul's reason for not quitting? He said it this way in another text, for me to live is Christ. Christ was his goal. Christ was his object of affection. Christ was everything to him. I can I ask you tonight, what is it that's going to move you away from the will of God? And if you notice there's some things in your life that's moving you away from the will of God, 
Here's what I would do. I would confess it and move back toward the will of God. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you tonight. Thank you for these folks that are here. Thank you for your word. And Lord, there's so much more I wanted to say. And Lord, how applicable this is to our days. Lord, I just pray as your people that we would be resolved to serve you and to please you and to obey you in all things. God, that's your desire. That's your will. And God, may we as your people not look for look at people, focus on people, focus on our problems, focus on prosperity. Lord, may our focus be upon you and Lord, how good you are. And God, may we desire to live for you more today than we did yesterday and God, even more tomorrow than we did today. Lord, I pray you continue to be with our service tonight. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right.